More revealing film footage documenting a long gone era now on BBC Two. Digital viewers can find out more by pressing the red button. This is Bradford on Thursday, the 10th of April, 1902. Filmed from the front of a tram. This film was made by the early filmmakers, Sagar Mitchell and James Kenyon. It's just one of hundreds of their films recently discovered in a cellar in Blackburn, Lancashire. The films were nearly lost forever. They take us to the world of the real Edwardians, in a way our generation has never seen before. We will find out who these people were and what their lives were like. These films open a wonderful window into the lives of the men, women and children who appear in them. They show us how they had fun, how they played sport, how they relaxed, what they got up to on holiday. When Mitchell and Kenyon shot these films at the dawn of the 20th century, they captured the essence of the times. Industry was going at full pelt. People were in work and so had more money than ever before. For the first time, they actually went on holidays and had half a day off each Saturday. They even had spare cash to enjoy their leisure. Life in the cotton mills and industries about the country was looking up. It wasn't Mitchell and Kenyon's aim to make an historic record of Edwardian life. Moving film had only recently been invented. But they weren't in it for the sake of art. They did it to entertain and to make a profit. The man standing by the gate in the Trilby is James Kenyon, aged 51 seen here directing the crowd from a local spinning company. He'd already made a living from cabinet making and penny in the slot machines, where he was known as a quiet, retiring man. Directing the action obviously awakened his more outgoing side. Kenyon threw his lot in with the inventive young entrepreneur Sagar Mitchell, who'd been running a photograph shop with his father. Together, Mitchell and Kenyon set out to make their fortune in the risky film trade, using the advertising slogans, local films, and we take them and make them. Up until the late 1990s, only a tiny handful of Mitchell and Kenyon films were known about. All this was about to change. Builders were stripping out a shop when they discovered three metal churns in the basement full of old film. They were about to dump them in the skip. At the last moment, they handed them over to local film enthusiast, Peter Worden. He realized immediately that this was a forgotten treasure of Mitchell and Kenyon films. He stored them carefully before donating the find to the nation. The British Film Institute took charge of the historic collection and painstakingly restored it. It took three years, but now the results are amazing. 
100-year-old films with hardly a scratch. Many as clear as the day they were shot. This film shows a football match. Well, there's nothing to identify the teams, the date, the location of the game, beyond what I can glean from the image itself. The two teams, well, one has um, shirts with dark vertical stripes, whether they're blue, black, is red, it's impossible to say. The other team has white, white shirts. There must be something here to inform me about what's going on. Ah, shot of goal. A save. Oh, yes. Goalie saves today. Absolutely charming. Now, oh, my goodness me. Who is this huge goalie? The goalie on the, on the other team with the vertical stripes. Huge fellow. Ah, oh, this is wonderful. He's taking a kick from goal. Here he goes, and he's running up. Oh, <laughs> he almost fell over. No. He must have been a bit of a character. From the team's shirts, we can tell it's Sheffield United playing Berry, and the ground is unmistakably Sheffield's Bramall Lane. So we consulted the fixtures lists for the years that Mitchell and Kenya did most of their filming, the early 1900s, which led us to guess at just a few possible dates. We went to the British Library's newspaper collection to check up on these. Some Mitchell and Kenyon films were well labelled with a date and a place, but others, like the Sheffield football films, are a bit of a mystery. I'm looking to the Sheffield Daily Telegraph for September the 8th, 1902. I'm looking for the um, sports pages. Ah, oh, here we are. Football. So here is an account of that game. The League Division 1, Sheffield United versus Bury. Cup holders win a poor game. Now, who are the cup holders? Let's look at the results. Ah, oh, Sheffield United 1, Bury 0. So Sheffield are the cup holders who <laughs> don't play very well. Now, who was that astonishing fat goalie? Here's the teams, Sheffield United. Oh, OK, here it is. In goal, a chap called Folks. Mr. Folks, the fat goalie. So that astonishing large man was called Folks. John Garrett's family had been watching Sheffield United from the club's earliest days, and he's an avid fan himself. That would probably be the, the cop side of the ground as we know it now, which would be behind the, uh, the goal. Uh, my grandfather would have been sort of living in the vicinity of the ground and watching Sheffield United at this time. And it's interesting to think whether he'd be actually in the crowd here watching the game. Now, that's looking at Bramall Lane as we see it now and the houses down the side of the, uh, the John Street ones. Well, there's some incredible players out here uh, just to see them actually brought to life. I mean, these are people who, prior to this, have really just been in books for us. That's Wilkinson, I believe. That'd be Herbert Chapman just coming on the goal there. That's Needham, who was Sheffield United England's captain. That's wonderful. There's Fatty Folks. I like the way he touches the trousers up there. That's brilliant, that. So it covers up to the... Uh, just under the nipples there. <laughs> Bang. William Henry Folk, to give him his, uh, his proper name, or Folks, depending on which spelling you see. Uh, really, when he signed for Sheffield United in 1894, was six foot two, which in those days was very, very tall for a man. Um, and he weighed, we think, 12 stones in weight, which I'm told is, is about average, uh, sort of size to height ratio. But with the most success that came to Sheffield United, with the league championship, with the first FA Cup, um, the more success that we brought, then the bigger Bill got. And I think his, uh, his girth tended to increase with the success of the football club. Uh, by the time the clip that we'd just seen uh, in 1902, uh, Bill, we think, would have weighed about 24 stones as his fighting weight. So I think it's pretty safe to assume that the nickname of Fatty Folks was well earned by that. But legend has it that although he was 24 stones in weight and 6 foot 2 in height, he was as agile as a cat. If you're a centre forward or a striker and you're coming through on goal and you're suddenly confronted with what can only be described as a mountain in a football kit, 
Uh, it must have been an off-putting thing. I mean, imagine standing up as a football player and trying to take a penalty against anybody built like that. Uh, his penalty record was absolutely phenomenal, but it's uh, such an intimidating figure. Fatty Fulks, whose bulk was such an issue, is responsible for one of the most famous football chants, which is still used by fans today. The chant of, of wet all the pies is, is levelled at players out on the pitch who uh, the away supporters think have probably piled a, a few a bit too much of the poundage on. Who wet all the pies, who wet all the pies. If you want to put you fat bastard in there as well, you can do, but I wouldn't advise it. <laughs> Football was a new passion for working men, even though it had been developed as an elite public school sport. By the end of the 19th century, it had swept the whole nation, particularly the industrial north. The reason why the football terraces shown in the films are so full is because working hours had been reduced. Most workers now had Saturday afternoons off as well as Sundays, so they could come and attend the games. In addition, wages had been increased so workers could afford the minimum entrance fee of sixpence. So they came here in their thousands, helping to create the Northern League of Clubs, including Newcastle, Manchester United and Liverpool, teams that still dominate the Premier League. This scratchy, foggy film shows Burnley running out of the players' tunnel. But forget its quality. This film is a world exclusive. The second team is Manchester United. This is the first ever film of the most famous football club in the world. Mitchell and Kenyon filmed the match at Turf Moor, Burnley, on the 6th of December, 1902. Manchester United are in their darker shirts, red as today. Burnley in lighter green, before they change their famous claret and blue. Manchester United are playing in their very first season as Man U. They had been called Newton Heath and had almost gone bankrupt the previous year. A rich local brewer rescued the club and nearly renamed it Manchester Central before this was rejected as sounding too much like a railway station. The film was meant to be shown at the Burnley Mechanics Institute that evening. But Manchester United won 2-0, so the film was suppressed. The showing cancelled. The film has never been seen by an audience until now. It was a time before cinema, so normally Mitchell and Kenyon's films were shown in public halls or fairground tents. The films were, of course, silent. Sound effects came from a brass band, cymbals, or even real gunfire. Mitchell and Kenyon's method to draw in more punters for their sports films was to film not only the match, but the spectators themselves. So when the crowds flocked to watch the film that evening, they already knew the score. They just came for the highlights and to spot themselves on screen. It was more wedding video than Sky Sports. The problem was that Mitchell and Kenyon often failed to capture the best action in football and rugby. This film of Hunslet versus Leeds leaves a lot to be desired. The filmmakers needed a lot of light to film, and since kickoff was sometimes as late as 3.30, it often grew too dark in the winter to film the second half. Floodlights had been invented, but weren't widespread, so this film is pretty murky. And their equipment was clumsy. Cameras and tripods were heavy and stiff, so more often than not, they simply missed the main events. The final score was 16-0 to Hunslet, but Mitchell and Kenyon missed it all. In spite of these problems, Mitchell and Kenyon's sports films lay down a formula which is followed to this day. They film the player's entrance, the kickoff, 
the halftime entertainment and the mascots. They even capture some of the roughness. Films of over a hundred games of football and rugby were found in those rusty basement canisters, including up-and-coming football clubs like Newcastle United, Bradford City, and Preston North End. We managed to track down a Preston North Ender, George Harrison, who has a special interest in this film. You feel Rompton coming out? On their own? Unusually, usually both teams come out together. They do nowadays. Here we come, Preston. My granddad. He didn't lead him out. But so it's a funny feeling to see a young granddad. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm quite chuffed about that. I feel quite proud that he was my granddad. And you know, reach what he did doing football. I mean, he, he reached international status, which was a tremendous thing in them days. George's grandfather, Peter McBride, is the man carrying the ball. He had been scouted from Air United as a young man, then happily settled for the rest of his life playing on Preston's Deepdale ground. Here he is playing Wolverhampton Wanderers on the 19th of November, 1904. There looks like some lads in that team. They're probably the directors in front there, and the bowler acts in there. Dicky bow ties and whatnot. One thing you don't see now in a crowd is a football match, that's cigarette smoke and drifting up from the from the ground. And obviously we know it's not allowed nowadays to be smoking on football grounds. You know, we've got all the kids jumping and down in front of the camera. Everybody waving. Number of the men that had mustaches in those days compared with now. Quite a lot, but mostly flat, flat hats. Occasionally you get bowler hats. I don't know whether they were the better class people or not, but the flat hats were working class, mill workers and factory workers. Oh. That looks like it was a penalty. The game ended in a two-all draw. For Mitchell and Kenny, these films were hugely popular. There's always been money in sports filming. No surprise that they were soon outgrowing their shop in Blackburn. Not only were they busy making and selling their own films, they made extra money by developing and processing other people's films on the side. There was even a national film distribution network of sorts, giving them access to new markets. So in September 1901, they had to move from Mitchell's photographic shop to much bigger offices just around the corner with their own studio. They could now offer a selection of over 300 films for sale. The films covered an extraordinary range of local scenes. People rushing out of work. Displays by the local fire brigade.
agricultural shows. And this formal party in Nelson, Lancashire, which has turned out for an earth-shattering event. As Richard and Kenyon's film business was taking off, so did a new part of British life, leisure time. Sunday was, as ever, the day of rest. Here in West Park in Hull, it is a sunny Sunday in April, just after church. It is half past 12, and the congregation's gaily showing off their Sunday best. And what Sunday best it is! The women have fantastic floral arrangements on their hats, and all possible care has been lavished on the children. The rich could afford to dress up, but for poorer people, their outfits might have spent all week in the pawn shop. On Friday evening, after receiving the week's pay, they would retrieve their smart clothes for the Sunday promenade. But as time off for holidays became more common, there was more and more calling for best clothes. Easter and Christmas were already religious holiday fixtures. Here in Preston, each Easter Monday, the town's tradition, which continues to this day, was to roll hard-boiled eggs down the hill. In those days, instead of chocolate eggs, real ones were used. They were a symbol of rebirth and Christ's resurrection. But for most people, it was simply a great excuse for a party in the park. The man in the top hat throws his eggs in the air. But these girls hold tightly onto theirs. Even the baby in the pram is showing off her egg. The man who had thrown the eggs was a professional showman. He was amongst 30 or so entertainers who commissioned Mitchell and Kenyon to shoot or develop films for them. These men were a flamboyant, roguish lot. As entrepreneurial businessmen, they were trying to make money from moving pictures. Mitchell and Kenyon in their new shop could offer the showmen everything they needed. So soon the place was buzzing. One client was the owner of Pleasure Gardens in Sunnyvale, Yorkshire. Mr. Joseph Bunce commissioned Mitchell and Kenyon to make this promo film of his new amusements. Both private and public parks had sprung up in Victorian times. They were immensely popular, providing fresh air and recreation in the middle of industrial cities. Ancient religious holy days had recently been fixed as bank holidays, which gave people four free Mondays off a year. So bank holidays were the busy times. Up to 100,000 people came each year to have fun in Sunnyvale's leisure facilities. Richard and Kenyon spiced up their ad with some additional action. The man and the woman on the donkeys are actors. And here they are in another scene. In fact, she is a he. Richard and Kenyon and the showman knew what really tickled the audience ten years before Charlie Chaplin hit the silver screen. Slapstick.
the bowler-hatted showman sets up a man from the crowd. He clears a sightline for the camera and calls action. And here the showman and the topper tell his assistants to create a scene. The most flamboyant and inventive showman of the lot was A.D. Thomas, seen directing a parade, then reaping the rewards. Richard and Kenyon are always on the lookout for new business opportunities, and in 1901, A.D. Thomas burst into their lives, ready to strike a deal for the two to develop his films. He had aspirations far greater than most showmen, so far in fact that he styled himself the picture king, the master mind of the world. A.D. Thomas then decided to masquerade as one of the most famous inventors of all time, Thomas Edison who created the phonograph, electric light, and maybe even the movie camera. A.D. Thomas dreamt up all sorts of new ways of telling stories. For instance, the first action replay. One popular film uncovered the great cricketing scandal of the year. It was made here at Old Trafford and starred one of the leading cricketers of the age, Arthur Mould. He played for Lancashire and was one of the most feared bowlers in the country. We tracked down his granddaughter, Anne Neal. I mean, to think that somebody filmed this all those years ago. You felt as though you wanted to go and say, Hi, grandfather. You know, I'm your granddaughter. <laughs> Arthur Mould had an impressive career behind him. At the height of his success in 1894, he took 207 wickets for Lancashire. This day, the 11th of July, 1901, Lancashire played Somerset at Old Trafford. But it was no ordinary match. The umpire, an Australian called Jim Phillips, seen here coming off last in the Trilby, repeatedly no bald mould. Not once, but five times in one over, and 19 times in total before lunch. Phillips claimed mould was chucking the ball rather than bowling it. The crowd came close to protesting. Jim Phillips was saying that his arm wasn't upright and he was, his arm was coming around throwing. And the others were saying it was, you know, a genuine action. The crowd was so fo uh, in favour or for Arthur Mould and they couldn't see anything wrong. And I think it was really getting to them that somebody could do this to a, a, just a cricketer they respected and everything else. Nasty little man. A.D. Thomas immediately caught wind of the scandal unfolding at Old Trafford. He sent his film crew over and asked Mould and the famous batsman A.N. Hornby to reenact what had happened on the pitch. This bowling action to modern day eyes looks suspect and too low. Mould's arm is not close to his ear as it would be today. In fact, this was perfectly acceptable then. Until 1864, bowlers were not allowed to lift their arm above their shoulder. Mole's problem is that he's being accused of dropping his elbow, bowling with a crooked arm. It looks quite straight here. 
in Arthur's case, I think it was not guilty. Uh, proved by photographs, film. The Manchester Evening News decided the most interesting pictures confirm that Mole's delivery is absolutely fair. There's absolutely no suspicion of throwing. Even though Mole was exonerated in the minds of the public, in private his family knew the whole affair had left its mark. He'd had a great career. Uh, he'd taken so many wickets. It was, you know, people always talked about the wickets Arthur Mould had taken. And then, at the very end, that uh, an umpire should step forward and suddenly noble him at the end of his career. And I think it really saddened him. I mean, it's like a blot, isn't it? I could, I could feel for him, really. With hits like the Mould film, things were looking good for A.D. Thomas. He was controlling an intricate network of film crews all over the British Isles, training and employing showmen and assistants from London to Yorkshire, from Ireland to Edinburgh. He was hiring public halls to project his films. He even roped in his family, including his wife. For Mitchell and Kenyon, the business arrangement with A.D. Thomas was highly lucrative. But they still made their own films, like these of the River Dee at Chester, which are also immensely popular. Likely crowd puller was a newly founded Birmingham University's first ever degree day in July 1901. The citizens turned out in their hundreds to watch the procession of brightly coloured robes, mortar boards, and the university chancellor Joseph Chamberlain, famous for being the man who made Birmingham a great Victorian city. Birmingham University, like the other civic universities of Manchester, Sheffield, and Bristol was founded in a great wave of university expansion, opening up higher education to a broader range of people, including women. Till the turn of the century, women had been allowed to attend courses, but not to take degrees. Birmingham now joined a small handful of universities, proudly making no distinction of sex. In the Birmingham Daily Mail of Saturday, July the 6th, 1901, is an account of the first degree congregation of Birmingham University. It's a long account and rather fascinating. It says here, among the ten waiting bachelors was one young lady, Miss Caroline Edith Morgan. Gosh, um, it says here, she looked charming in her white dress and bright scarlet tie, only partially hidden beneath her black gown with its flying strings. With a slight blush and a merry smile, the first girl graduate, that's in capitals, gosh, it's so patronizing, um, of Birmingham University, mounted the steps and approached the chancellor, who repeated the formula of admission amid the hearty plaudits of the great audience. One of the audacious students shouted the advice to kiss her, but the Chancellor discreetly ignored the somewhat disconcerting counsel. I was determined to track down Miss Morgan using the national census of 1901 and then contacting the university. They sent a list of their first graduates and here we find her. 
But maybe she got married and changed her name, because this is where the paper trail stops. Very frustrating. The future for educated women like Caroline Morgan held few options if they actually wanted to work. They could become school teachers or nurses, but professions like law were firmly closed upon them. And you must remember, it was another 17 years before women could even vote. The women's movement was on the march. Both middle-class and working-class women were pushing for work opportunities beyond teaching and caring. They were also demanding full political rights. The movement might have been split between the suffragettes and the suffragists. But all the activists, whatever their methods, dressed up in full Edwardian finery, flowery hats and flouncy dresses, to counter the accusation that feminists were unfeminine. There was still a large premium on female respectability. The Coventry Town Fathers used the annual Lady Godiva procession to boost their civic prestige. The medieval legend of Godiva rescuing the town by riding naked through the streets was reenacted each year. In the past, the parade of a seemingly naked woman had made the townsfolk gawp and leer. The London actress Vera Geddes was in the starring role. But this year, the town fathers had made a bid at respectability by draping her in chiffon. Sagar Mitchell and James Kenyon decided they needed assistance to cope with the increasing workload. They were taught how to crank the film cameras by hand, judging the right speed and the right distance, a tricky procedure. Too slow, and the film would be too jerky too fast and he used up too much film. This exuberant carnival procession in crew was in aid of their local hospital. In the time before the distractions of television and radio, an enormous amount of effort went into designing the amazing costumes, dances and routines. Look closely at these clog dancers. You will see they are all men. At carnival time for thousands of years, Men became women, white became black, as the world was temporarily turned upside down. Next around the corner, I came across this section of the march. The men are blacked up as both male and female gollywogs, doing a dance routine. This blacking up craze stemmed from American musical traditions of so-called coons and nigger minstrels. But of course the British Empire was multiracial. Britain still ruled a quarter of the globe, and the British attitude to non-white races was one of superiority. Black people were seen as a more primitive race. 